A very warm welcome from the students of Indian Institute of Management to our esteemed speaker today, Dr. Helen Rosenbaum. We welcome you to the eTalk, ma'am, and we really look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. And Helen will share her insights on why the moratorium on deep sea mining is the only responsible way forward. Uh, Helen, uh, most of us are familiar with mining on land, but not with deep sea mining. Uh, can you please tell us what deep sea mining is and where does exploration occur? We are really keen to know what, all, what it is about. Okay, thank you. And thank you for your warm welcome as well. It's um, amazing the technology we have and I can be sitting here in my office in my um, small town in Queensland and, and be um, engaging um, with you all in India. And, um, and I just want to acknowledge also just the much harder situation that I know that you're in at the moment with COVID and I hope it gets better for, for everybody. Um, before I do answer your, your question, I just wanted to also say that um, it would be good to keep in mind another sustainable development goal, and that's um, SDG 12, um, as we talk through, through this. Um, SDG 12 is about ensuring sustainable consumption pattern, uh, some, so, sorry, ensuring sustainable consumption and production patterns. So um, as we talk through um, today, I think um, that the link with that will become even more obvious. Um, so deep sea mining is um, a very rapidly expanding industry. Uh, well, when I say it's an expanding industry, it hasn't actually started in commercial form yet. It's only um, uh, been developing as an exploration and ex in, it's been developing its exploration uh, capacity and also is regarded as, as still as experimental in terms of its commercialization. Um, but the fact is that it's been driven by a handful of uh, companies mainly and their speculative, um, speculative investors and uh, it's it's almost driven like a, a frenzy of exploration in our in our world's oceans. So at the moment, um, deep sea exp uh, mining mineral exploration um, is occurring in in all our seas. Um, there's there's exploration in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian oceans. Um, I'm not ex an expert on um, what's happening in the Indian Ocean, but I understand that last year India launched an, a big oceans program and a big component of that program was to develop capacity for um, deep sea mining and in particular the mining of uh, deep sea nodules and that's what I'll be talking about um, much more as, as we proceed. Um, there's um, millions of square kilometres of deep sea ocean floor under exploration licence at the moment. And I think that's a little known fact. Most people don't realise that this industry, which is about to you know, start on our doorstep, is, um, you know, is, is you know, already covering so much of, of the seabed. Um, those licenses have been issued by the, an authority called the International Seabed Authority. It's a United Nations auspiced organisation that has been mandated to manage the resources of the, of the deep sea and to uh, develop regulations both for exploration and for, uh, for mining. Uh, at the moment, it's, fin it's finalised the, the regulations for exploration and it's uh, granted 30 licences to date, um, including those licences in, in the Indian Ocean. And um, I believe those licences are for, for nodule mining, although uh, I understand that the Indian government is also interested in the mining of hydrothermal vents. So deep sea mining, um, when, when I say deep sea, uh, we're talking mainly three kilometres and, um, and deeper 
under under the sea, three to six kilometres um, generally. If, um, our campaign, the deep sea mining campaign, uh, started 10 years ago. And we started with a, a focus on um, the, the proposed mining in Papua New Guinea. Uh, I'm based in Australia. Um, some of my colleagues are based in Australia and we've had a lot of experience with um, mining issues, uh, land-based mining issues in Papua New Guinea. And uh, I was working there as a community development consultant and I came to understand that there, that there was a lot of concern uh, in the islands of East New Britain and New Ireland uh, about this proposed deep sea mine, which at the time I thought was pure fantasy and couldn't understand how really they could be thinking to develop a mine at the bottom of the sea. But um, as, as it turned out, um, this, this was no fantasy and uh, licenses were already um, provided to the mining company to start mining. So our campaign focused on this first mine. Um, it was um, the... the uh, proponents of that mine, are a Canadian company called Nautilus. Uh, and the mine was called Solwara One, Solwara being um, Papua New Guinea pigeon for salt water. So uh, over the last 10 years, we've been focusing very much on this, this one particular mine because uh, we're a very small campaign. And, um, and because at that time, that was the key mine to, to focus on. Uh, there weren't many other uh, mines that were being licensed. It was the first uh, mine in the world to be granted, a seabed mine in the world to be granted an operating license. And it was aiming to mine hydrothermal vents only 30 kilometres away from uh, coastal communities. Um, over the last 10 years um, since we started, there's been such a flurry of um, exploration and so many companies from all over the world, um, so many um, government um, state-owned enterprises, so many consortia that have, have shown interest in, in seabed mining. So um, the situation has changed very rapidly just over the last 10 years. Um, and just to just to, to go back to that first mine, uh, Nautilus, it's um, it's now bankrupt. Uh, the community opposition to it was so strong. Um, we we also conducted quite a lot of financial advocacy, um, talking to banks and um, potential investors about the environmental and social um, governance issues related to such a high risk venture. Uh, the company could not get the, the finances it needed to, to continue working. And um, so uh, just a few months ago, it was declared uh, bankrupt. Uh, but um, which means that we now, um, as a campaign, we now focus um, on, on what's happening in the Pacific more widely. Um, the deep sea mining, uh, the kinds of um, substrates that they're after, the kinds of deposits they're looking at in the seafloor are mainly, um, uh, well, there's, there's three key, 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 times of, key kinds of deposits that they're looking for. Um, uh, most, mostly it's these polymetallic nodules. Um, there's also hyd the hydrothermal vents. Hydrothermal vents are um, as um, what proposed mine in Papua New Guinea was, was looking to exploit. Uh, these are uh, amazing underwater gazes that just spurt out um, very hot fluid that's very mineral rich. And over thousands of years, the, the fluid builds up and up and up until you have these huge spires. And um, they're called black smokers because if you if you look at them, um, you can Google this and, and see photos of them. Um, they look like these like sort of factory um, spires, um, pipes just sort of spurting out these um, these big black um, the smoke. And it's that min mineral rich um, sediment that the companies are, are after. Um, polymetallic nodules. Uh, these strange um, cannibal type um, metal rich rocks. 
that lie on the bottom of very deep sea plains. So the area that's been of most interest to companies from polymetallic nodules is this area called the clarion clipton zone it's the area of the pacific ocean that lies between uh, kiribati and mexico it spans uh, four and a half thousand kilometers and um, in our report that we've just released um, called predicting the impacts of mining deep sea polymetallic nodules um, if, if you uh, would like to download that report um, you'll be able to see a map in there that shows the the licenses that have been issued within that clarion clipperton zone and that whole span of four and a half thousand kilometers is actually um, a big patchwork of um, of exploration licenses about 75 percent of, of that area that four and a half thousand kilometers uh, is under exploration license to the width of um, about a thousand kilometers so i think we could say there's in just in that one area alone there's about three million a little bit over three million square kilometers that are under exploration license of just that part of the of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and that's roughly um, about half the land mass of Australia. So if if that if mining continues in that area, what we're looking at is possibly the largest um, mine on the planet. Um, as a series of um, you know uh, sort of rolling um, seabed mines, um, there's also um, some mining exploration that um, has been licensed in the EEZs, the Exclusive Economic Zones. Um, that they're the 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 zones of the ocean that are under the national jurisdiction of, of, of countries. So um, the Cook Islands and the Pacific, for example, has um, licensed uh, a Belgian company to explore in, in its national waters. And um, as I said before, Papua New Guinea has, has um, granted these licenses to this company that's now bankrupt, but those licenses are still live and we're, we're wondering what's going to be happening with those licenses. Uh, what are the hazards of uh, uh, my, my deep sea polymetallic uh, nodules mining? What are the hazards uh, related to them? Well, why, why is it not good? Uh, well, these polymetallic nodules, they you know, the, the mining companies like to present that these, um, a picture of these nodules and the deep sea being an ecological desert. It's, it suits them to, to tell people that um, there's nothing down there. Um, these nodules, they're just these lumps of strange looking rocks. Uh, we're going to come along and we're going to just vacuum them up and clean up the ocean a bit. And um, they present it as if there's there's no there's not going to be an impact at all. These rocks are just sitting there waiting to be picked up. Um, the truth is that um, very very little is known about the deep sea anywhere, even in the um, areas that the fields that don't have these polymetallic nodules, um, the other kinds of substrates. Very very little is known about the ecologies of these places. It's very hard to get down there and it's very expensive to do research down there and unfortunately that means most of the science that has been done has been done by mining companies or paid for one way or another by mining companies. So it's only uh, recently as scientists have become concerned uh, about the that you know that that deep sea mining is is likely to become a reality that there's been more independent science um, that's being done there so at the moment there's just a dearth of science you know a lot of people like to say that we know more about the surface of mars than we know about um, the deep ocean floor and the deep ocean environments so these metallic um lumps these these nodules they're um they they're, they're sitting in uh, uh, basically in this vast deep underwater plain. Um, as I was saying before, these plains um, 
uh, are about three and a half down to six kilometers below the water, the, the surface of the ocean. And they, they're sitting in kind of like a, a, a soupy mud on the, on the bottom um, of, of the ocean. And no one really knows how these nodules have been formed. We don't, we don't know um, the basis of these nodules. It's, it's thought that are, you know, they, they have some kind of biological core and then um, they've become mineralized a, around the core. It's known that they take millions of years to develop. And um, they form a habitat um, for many organisms down there. They're, there's not many hard surfaces down on this soupy, muddy ocean floor, except for these nodules. And so all sorts of organisms um, adhere, to, um, adhere to the nodules um, and also other organisms that are mobile organisms um, use the nodules to lay eggs in, um, they use it for foraging, they find food around the nodules, and there's a whole ecosystem of, of microbes as well um, down there. It's thought that the deep ocean floor plays um, quite an important role as a carbon sink, but again, you know, the data is still coming in and, and we still don't know um, very much about it. But um, scientists have warned um, that disturbing the ocean floor could actually um, exacerbate climate change in ways we don't even really understand now. But to get back to the nodules themselves, the um, removal of those nodules means that um, essentially, because they take so long to develop, essentially you're removing that habitat um, permanently, so the the nodules and the and the organisms that depend on those nodules will be gone permanently. You know, once mining starts, um, and I've heard it referred to as strip mining the ocean, um, th those habitats will be gone forever. But the other way in which, and and perhaps the more um, the way that will affect most more of us. Um, is that the mining operation is going to have to discharge mine waste. And um, there's been quite a lot of discussion um, amongst mining companies about what is the ideal um, depth in the ocean to discharge the mine waste. But the fact is, whatever um, depth they choose to discharge the mine waste, um, it will create a constant plume for the for the life of the mine and we actually don't know what is going to be on the plume there'll be a lot of sediment from the sea floor in that plume um, there could be heavy metals um, carried in that plume we know nothing um, about how bioavailable those metals would be meaning how readily will they be taken up in the food chain the marine food chains and how readily will they affect the top predator um, that top predator is us humans and um, um, it's known that metals um, do you know uh, you know uh, convey themselves through the, through marine food chains quite quite readily. Um, there could be processing agents in in the, those plumes. Um, the sediment from the seafloor is very fine grained, and uh, it takes a long time to settle again. And um, the estimates of um, the spread of these plumes, depending on the assumption that's used, some assumptions that are used in the modelling ranges from up to 200 kilometers to thousands of kilometers. So whatever happens down there in the deep ocean isn't going to stay in the deep ocean. It's going to affect all of us all around the world. And uh, our focus being the Pacific Ocean, uh, it means that all, you know, the, all of the Pacific islands um, are likely to be affected, even if it's out in the clarion Clipperton zone. Uh, there's many animals that migrate um, and use that area to pass through regularly. There's um, uh, fisheries, high value fisheries that are at stake here. Uh, the Pacific tuna fishery a couple of years ago was worth $6 billion. It creates so many jobs. 
so they're just some of the impacts of um, that we, we might expect from seabed mining. And our report that we've just released goes through that in quite um, a lot of scientific detail. The uh, report is actually a review of over 250 peer reviewed um, scientific articles and other articles. So this report represents the, the current state of the art thinking about um, the mining of deep sea polymetallic nodules. And uh, I think it's very relevant to the Indian situation, given that that's what the Indian government is interested in doing in the Indian Ocean. Uh, you have uh, uh, mentioned your deep sea mining campaign and how you were at least able to throw out one company and let it go bankrupt. But uh, can you uh, uh, tell us a little more about it? What are your future plans of action? Because maybe, uh, as you said, that there, there would be other companies who might be coming and trying their luck. And uh, your campaign basically is uh, for the Pacific Ocean. So do you have plans of involving the Indian counterparts to start a similar one in India? For the Indian Ocean. Oh, oh, look, we would love to, you know, if, if um, we would love to support. Um, we're, we're a very small organisation ourselves, but we work with a, a coalition called the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. And this is a coalition of over 80 uh, different civil society organisations from all around the world. And um, I think the Goa Foundation in India has, has joined recently because of concern over, over seabed mining. So um, through that coalition, uh, we, we were all calling for a moratorium on the issuing of further exploration licenses and also a moratorium on the development of these regulations because there are so many uncertainties about the impacts of, of seabed mining at this point in time um, that, you know, we can't take the risk um, for the sake of a handful of companies. You know, there's, there's so, many, um, so many other people's livelihoods, incomes, cultures at stake. So th that, is, that is our main, um, I suppose, um, strategy going forward is to work towards um, this moratorium. Um, so this would be a moratorium that applies to the, to the work of the International Seabed Authority, but also um, to try and, and persuade uh, governments to issue um, governments that have their own economic, exclusive economic zones, their own um, waters to also, um, you know, uh, declare a moratorium within their own waters. And um, we were very heartened last year when the um, Prime Minister of Fiji at a Pacific Island uh, leaders meeting called on uh, fellow Pacific Island leaders to do that, to declare a moratorium in their national waters on seabed uh, mining and um, Fiji has actually enacted that. At that time, um, Papua New Guinea and Vanuatu's governments um, supported it in principle, but um, we haven't yet seen any action on the ground to actually in, in act that, enact that moratorium. But that's, that's the kind of um, way, you know, that we would like to work with our colleagues in the Pacific. Um, our role as a campaign, because we're, we're kind of in the Pacific region, but we're not Pacific Islanders as such. So our, our role is really to do research, to um, provide information, to um, work at the levels that are appropriate for us to work. Um, for example, through this financial advocacy, um, we certainly won't be advocating directly to Pacific Island leaders ourselves. But um, I, I mentioned the International Seabed Authority. Um, we've, we're very concerned about the, the bias and the corporate capture of the International Seabed Authority. I know this is not unique amongst um, United Nations organisations. So I, I know that there's criticism of this kind of thing um, occurring 
with um, with other United Nations bodies. But what we see with this body that's, you know, has a mandate to look after the deep sea on behalf of all the member members of the ISA, which are the United Nations members and um, the member countries and their communities. What we see is the Secretary, Secretary General of, of this very organisation has actually become like a poster boy for um, particularly one of the companies, a company called Deep Green um, Metals. Um, the, the Secretary General is a man called Michael Lodge and uh, he, he actually um, appears in their promotional videos. He's um, participated in speaking events, including to Pacific Island leaders, where because of his position, he looks like he's a, a, um, a person of authority who has the interests of um, the Pacific Islands and their care of the ocean at heart. But what he's doing is really pushing um, seabed mining towards these, these leaders. Um, we, we issued, uh, we, we released a report last year um, called Why the Rush, um, referring to why the rush to mine, to, to, um, for deep sea mining in the Pacific Ocean. And we used as a, um, a cover photo for that um, report, something that we thought was a photo that spoke a thousand words. Um, it was a photo of um, Michael Lodge, the Secretary General of the IGA, sitting um, very, looking very pleased with himself, sitting with his um, deep green hard hat on, like a mining hard hat, um, on board uh, a deep green vessel and it was taken at the launch of their surface research vessel and he tweeted this photo himself I'm totally unaware that this would sort of indicate a total conflict of of interest and um, it looks like as if he's totally you know um, forgotten what what the mandate of his organization is and so uh, we feel that the the mining companies have um, far more sway in the International Seabed Authority um, than perhaps even, even individual government, some individual governments do. Who, there, is, there are some governments who are very cautious about um, seabed mining. That, that African group of countries has been particularly cautious. Um, it might be interesting for you, for you and for the students to, to have a look at what India has been doing and what their role has been at the ISA and how actively perhaps they've been, you know, really pushing the development of these regulations. Because the companies can't wait for these regulations to, to be developed because that's when the money's going to roll into them for them. They're making their money from speculation. So they've got their exploration licenses in place, even though they don't really have the technology, you know, um, ready to go yet. As soon as the licenses, um, the, the regulations are finished for seabed um, mining itself and they can be granted seabed mining licenses that's when they think at least they're going to be able to um you know bring you know bring in a whole lot of money to, for themselves so um they're really pushing the the isa to develop these licenses as as soon as possible and uh we were very worried that under the cover of covid um, the ISA was going to push through its July meeting and uh, without transparency and without the observation of civil society, um, we were very worried it was just going to ram through um, these, these licences. Uh, we found out just last night, because we've all been very active, all of this um, conservation, Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, in different ways, we've all been really actively lobbying about um, that it's not appropriate, that this cannot occur, they must not go ahead with the July meeting. Um, you know, there must be full participation um, by um, governments and by, by civil society. And so we just heard um, last night that the Secretary General has deferred um, the July meeting now. It's going to occur in October. Um, whether, who knows whether we're all going to be able to travel and, you know, who can participate at this meeting in October. But um, at least um, that's, that's one worry um, that's, you know, off the, 
off the boiler just just for the immediate future. Um, even Forbes magazine, actually, um, a couple of weeks ago, it listed um, a, a list of 10 um, environmental problems that were most likely to get worse under COVID. And um, the ISA passing these regulations was sort of ranked at number five in that list. So um, it, it was a serious worry. But one, one, one other thing I'll just say about the ISA, um, when, I, when I talked before about full participation, that was actually uh, probably an exaggeration because uh, NGOs only have observation um, observer status. Um, we don't have no full participant status. And to date, um, I don't think there's been any government that's invited um, a civil society you know, representative to speak on the behalf of the government. But they have, this country, Deep Green, it's part, this company, Deep Green, has partnered with Nauru. And um, it spoke, um, using the chair of Nauru, on behalf of the Nauruan government last year, really again, you know, urging the the other countries' um, government representatives there to, you know, quickly finalise um, these these regulations. It's in nobody's interest, apart from the companies, to finalise these regula regulations quickly, and um, and that's why we're we're calling for a moratorium. We we have to fill those information gaps and understand what the impacts of seabed mining are going to be and before we can go ahead you know, with, with anything like this. So actually this is another uh, example of corporate capture, what we call. It's just one more example yes. of corporate capture uh, in the making. And uh, you spoke about community participation and opposition from the communities, which at least helped uh, one such company go bust. Uh, yes. So do you think, uh, or can you say something about the role of community and how they should be prepared from now on only? Because perhaps at a later stage, it becomes too late to mobilize uh, uh, community efforts. Uh, perhaps they are uh, the shield against, uh, they are an important part in a shield against uh, such corporate capture. So. Well, you know, in, in our countries that are, you know, we may criticise our democracies, but at least, you know, countries like Australia and like India, we, we are democracies. And I pretend to know nothing about the, um, you know, the, the politics of India. I am absolutely no, no expert. And I know there are, you know, there are lots of problems as well. But um, from the experience of Papua New Guinea and also seeing how the civil society works in the Pacific, the voices of those um, community leaders has been um, really um, quite, quite strong and, um, and quite influential um, in terms of um, uh, mobilising others in the community around them. So, for example, in Papua New Guinea, the, the local communities there from quite remote islands, actually, have been agitating in their own small places about this, um, this particular mine that I mentioned before, the Solwara One mine. And um, they felt that they were, you know, really on their own, they were forgotten by the world. And gradually, you know, the message came out um, from outside Putney Guinea to, um, to others who were concerned about this. And together we've been able to, to work. So um, those, those community organisations, um, they've, they've formed themselves into an alliance called the Alliance of Saltwara Warriors, Saltwater Warriors. And they, um, they represent um, about 23 different island and coastal communities that feel that they're going to be affected if, if this um, mine still goes ahead, because we're still, we're still worried about it, because um, even though the company is bankrupt, um, the two main investors in that company have formed another company, and their official line is, even though we think they have no equipment anymore, they don't have um, the vessel that they invested a lot of money in, um, that was a key part of their operational um, structure, 
And um, we know that they've sold off some of their other licenses uh, in the Pacific. But, um, you know, it's, it's quite possible those licenses for this um, Solwara mine, one mine have not been cancelled. And that's what um, the, um, our Papua New Guinea allies are working hard on now, lobbying the government to, to cancel those licenses and enact the moratorium that the, um, that the Prime Minister um, of Papua New Guinea supported um, the call for the moratorium last year at the Pacific Island Leaders Meeting. And they've um, developed from just having, you know, a very small group of um, isolated islanders to having um, the Papua New Guinea church movement on board. And in Papua New Guinea, the churches are, are very significant players. Um, they fulfill a lot of the, the um, societal roles and um, so like social um, welfare functions that the government isn't able to fulfill. They provide a lot of health services, a lot of education services, and they are themselves very influential from the very grassroots villages right through to uh, the, you know, the ministerial level, they're able to um, exert influence. Because even um, ministers in Papua New Guinea, um, it's quite a, you know, a religious country. And, you know, even ministers and government officials will be part of, you know, different churches, involved with different churches. So um, they've, they've been very instrumental. And, um, and uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know if any of that seems relevant to the, uh, the Indian situation. Um, perhaps um, others might be able to, to comment on that. But I guess it's, um, you know, our strategy, I suppose, in a way has been um, bottom up and perhaps also top down. So bottom up from the grassroots, but also um, meeting with organisations that are able to work at a very high level. So for example, in the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, uh, there are members who do attend the um, International Seabed Authority meetings as observers and attend many different United Nations um, meetings that are relevant to the ocean and um, the, uh, the care of the oceans beyond the national jurisdictions. Um, our own campaign, um, we're too small to be able to focus on that as well as our, our small area of work, but we stay connected um, with and and by um, by our colleagues who are able to work at that letter level, and similarly, you know, we also take our cue from the um, the organisations that are working at the grassroots. And um, in some ways, I think we've probably um, uh, you know we've operated as a bit of a link between between those levels. Um, although increasingly our grassroots um, allies, uh, you know, their capacity has really um, developed so amazingly over the last 10 years. And um, they're, you know, they're, they're now able to attend, you know, sometimes these higher level meetings themselves. Uh, in the Pacific Islands more, more broadly, there are many regional NGOs who have, um, you know, a, you know, routinely attend um, United Nations level meetings and, um, and they fulfill that role with, with grassroots communities there. So um, I'm not sure what, what the learnings from that might be. Perhaps some um, others on, on this webinar might, might have more to say about that. Uh, uh, Helen, uh, the Intergovernmental Meeting on Business and Human Rights uh, Treaty will be held on uh, May 29th. So what's your message to governments to consider permanent moratorium on deep sea mining? I think uh, uh, to be oh, put forward. I think that would be, um, yeah, I think that would be um, a great message to take. Um, um, that's something um, we haven't really um, considered in detail ourselves as a small campaign, mm -hmm. but, um, but I'm sure some of our colleagues are, and I will actually, um, after that reminder from you, I will actually um, connect with them again over that. Um, will, will anyone from India be going to that meeting and uh, be taking that kind of message? 
Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. Many thanks for this really very informative uh, uh, talk. And we now open for the question and answer session. Participants, I know you must be feeling sleepy because it's on uh, quarter to one, uh, two here in India. And very oh, hot, very hot. Very hot. hot. Very oh, hot. sorry. Yeah. 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 And we are locked down in our houses, but still, please raise your virtual hand to ask your question or type in your questions in the chat box. And uh, we already have uh, some questions, Helen. Uh, one question is that uh, what about the socioeconomic benefits of deep sea mining? And uh, uh, particularly now, with COVID-19, economies are cash strapped globally and uh, perhaps could they be an important source of revenue? So Yes, but, yes, thank you, thank you for that question. Yes. yes, because, um, you know, definitely the, the companies and the governments are really keen to, um, to conduct deep sea mining and I assume in, in U India as well, you know, they, um, they use that as an argument. Um, what we have seen in the, in the Pacific is that um, land-based mining has had a very bad track record. Mm. Uh, it has not produced the expected development or the expected wealth for communities. Uh, or countries, and in fact, it's often created um, environmental problems that are then disadvantaged communities, so, and have taken you know um, extra resources, sometimes the the country's resources rather than the company's resources, to clean up afterwards. Um, for example, where I'm most familiar in in Papua New Guinea, um, you know, many land-based mines have polluted waterways um, to the extent that communities who were once able to be self-sufficient in food, who were well-nourished communities, are now well um, malnourished and are dependent on store-bought food that they can't actually really afford. So, you know, it's brought great disadvantage. So. Um, the fact that terrestrial mining has not um, been able to create the, the wealth, um, despite it there being, you know, their mines on the surface that we can see and access, they might be in, you know, mountains that are a little bit remote. But boy, these seabed mines are going to be totally remote. No one is going to know what's going on down there apart from the companies. And, um, and we won't know the, um, what the impacts will be until possibly after the mining has occurred, because the way the seabed mining um, is conceptualized is that it's small compact plots um, and that they'll mine one plot, then it's all very mobile. Um, this, is, this is kind of a, a, a real selling point for the companies when they when they talk to the investors that there's no communities that can interfere with us um, you know we're, we're not really what we're doing isn't really obvious um, and um, basically if they cause a problem in one place they can they can pick up and go to you know a whole different place with their with their mobile mining infrastructure so um, the problem is we won't we know won't know what the, um, the the sort of economic and social impacts are going to be until after the the mining has occurred, and um, so I guess we say that you know if terrestrial mining has not been able to be managed well, um, what makes us think that we can trust these same kind of companies to operate at the at the seabed, and um, and do a better job. And um, if terrestrial mining hasn't been able to um, bring wealth to, to countries, why do we think, you know, deep sea mining um, will do that? Why will it be an economic panacea? And um, the other aspect of that is to look at what countries already have in terms of resources um, that are dependent on the marine environment. Um, I'm sure India, with um, all that vast um, economic zone in the Indian Ocean, must have a have a really strong um, fishing economy. I don't I don't know what the the value of India's fisheries is, but. As I mentioned, I think I mentioned before that the Pacific tuna fishery, just that one fishery alone is worth $6 billion a year. Um, there's quite a bit of um, marine based tourism um, in, the, in the Pacific. All those kinds of things and those current sources of incomes and those 
um, current um, ways of generating jobs um, will be at risk. So um, I guess that's that's what you know needs needs to be weighed up. And um, deep sea mining won't employ a lot of people. Um, it's that's another selling point from the industry. You know, every, there's going to be remotely operated vehicles um, with um, a crew up on a, um, uh, a a surface vessel that controls the um, the the remote machinery down below. Um, it may not even you know need very much of um, employ local community. Uh, uh, people from the local community, um, at least land-based mines, you know, do do that and they do train people, certain people from the local communities to, to work in them. At least that's the experience in the Pacific. So, okay. Um, okay, thank you. We have a question from Ashok Srimali. Uh, Ashok, would you like to ask your question yourself? Ashok Srimali. He has put the question in the chat box, but if he wants to ask himself, um, let's see. Hello. Yes. Yes, I, I I have already posted. I have a question yes. that uh, you see in India, like uh, that uh, public sector unit like ONGC and all these. So they are also the, um, uh, mining for oil and petroleum and all these near Bombay High and all these. So, you know, how much uh, risk actually environment degradation and also due to that salinity increase, how much it will affect? That is also another question. Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, um, there must be something a bit awkward with the sound system. It was very um, muffled for me. Um, um, Can I repeat perhaps, the question briefly? Yes, yes, yes please. Yes, please. Thank uh, you. He wants to know what is the risk on coastal areas uh, to, due to deep sea mining and uh, what yeah. about environmental degradation also which it would bring about? Can you just elaborate on that? Well, sure. Um, well, something that I think traditional island and coastal communities probably know, certainly in the Pacific, is that the, and, and science is really only just starting to catch up with now, is that the sea is a huge interconnected environment. Um, I think I alluded to that before, you know, where, you know, when I said that what happens in the deep sea doesn't stay in the deep sea. Um, the, 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 the waters of the sea are connected, um, the deep sea to the midwater, to the surface water, to the reefs, to the lagoons. Um, it may take a little bit of time for the currents to, um, to, to work their way through, but, um, but the impacts will, you know, impacts from, um, uh, from pollution, um, from these, um, the waste discharge, um, the mechanism. And if you go to, say, one of these um, deep sea mining company sites, or um, even in our own report, we have a bit of a, a diagram of how seabed mining um, might work. Um, if you imagine that there's um, these robots, um, these um, huge machines that are, you know, operated remotely down on the sea floor, churning away and um, collecting these these nodules. Or if it's hydrothermal vents, the same thing. They're flattening, and India has hydrothermal vents too. Um, they're flattening these beautiful black smoker spires, and they're creating a lot of a lot of um, clouds of this dust and sediment that are, are then going up into the currents and can, can be taken up into to the higher waters. Um, but there's also um, going to be some kind of pipe, um, it's often called a riser pipe, that goes from the seabed up to the surface, to the surface um, support vessel. Um, where the initial processing of whether it's hydrothermal vent sediment or the or the nodules will occur, and um, I mean I find it difficult myself to imagine a pipe um, that's going to travel up from the sea floor, you know, three, four, five, six kilometres without any accident, you know, <laughs> all sorts of things, especially with our um, increased storm events. Um, you know, can can break that pipe or or cause leakage from from that pipe, and in that pipe will be like a slurry of um, 
of or nodules in a slurry of mud, you know, going up. And um, wherever that breakage might occur, you know, there's going to be like a huge spreading out. It'll be kind of like an oil slick, I guess, you know, coming out away from that, that pipe. And um, I haven't done a scientific analysis of the difference in buoyancy between these grains or between, um, you know, oil, but because they're very fine grains, they'll, they'll spread a, a very long way. And as I was saying before, we don't know how toxic um, those, um, those sediments um, might be, and we don't know what impact they have. But there is a high risk that they will end up in, in the marine food chain and will end up in people's, um, you know, um, seafood um, that, uh, you know, coastal and island communities really, really depend on. Um, yeah, so, um, and also just um, the impacts um, through the food chain, you know, the, the impacts on other marine creatures and uh, what that might mean for the reproduction of um, the, you know, the fish that we rely on for fisheries or the fish that are the food of the fish that we rely on for fisheries. So all these things at the moment are just totally unknown, you know, and that's you know that's also why we're calling for a moratorium because it's just ridiculous that um, such a high risk industry might proceed and affect so many people around the world and we don't have these um, basic answers. So I guess in a way what we do is highlight where the risks are, um, where the plausible risks are. We're not just making things up, you know, out of the air. But for example, this um, report that we've just released, which we review, reviewed, you know, this large number of scientific articles. Um, out of that, we can reach um, a lot of very plausible conclusions uh, about the likely risks. And um, you know, the key conclusion is that um, what's going to happen on the deep seabed will be serious, long term and essentially irreversible in its in environmental impact. But there's likely to be um, very serious risks for the rest of the ocean environment and, um, and for the humans who depend on that ocean environment. And um, that's probably most of us in the world who depend one way or another on a healthy ocean environment. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'm sorry uh, for a mistake on my part because uh, Ashok Shrimali is from uh, Mines, Minerals and People's Group in India and they're part of the ESCR network also. Uh, Ashok ji, would you like to share some of your insights uh, and your work with ESCR net? So we'd be happy if you could share briefly your thoughts. Uh, yes, thank you, Shobha. Yes. Uh, actually, the, you see, uh, what our experience in uh, coastal built uh, mining area, actually, particularly the which state I am living, uh, it's Gujarat, mm -hmm. and uh, almost uh, India's uh, 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 coastline area, this is a Mansard coastline area of Gujarat. And uh, <coughs> uh, we can't hear you, uh, Ashok ji. Uh, issue of uh, livelihood and uh, also uh, the, the, the wildlife uh, and all this. So, flora and fauna also. Uh, and uh, the, the basic issue of uh, livelihood of uh, uh, but, uh, and great uh, threat to fisher folk also and uh, marginal farmer also. So, if deep sea is mining uh, will happen uh, in uh, our state or uh, any part of the uh, uh, India's coast, then what will happen? You see, and the, 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 because of uh, we have a series of uh, uh, you know natural calamities also. So, due to this. Uh, uh, mining effect or environment degradation, is there any chances to increase uh, the number of uh, uh, natural calamities in coastal belt? That is also my question. Mm. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. And uh, just. Shobha, maybe the. Shobha ji, 
Yes. Maybe you can correct my English also for the. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I, <laughs> no, no, no. You should not understand properly. No, no, no. Okay. no, no nothing, no, nothing. No. Because there's, there's nothing wrong with your uh, English uh, shock. Is, yeah, no, is no. Actually, English, English is not. Actually, uh, it, it, yeah, it's not my mother language. So the, maybe, no, uh, but uh, you no, better understand. No, yeah. no, it's it's no, actually no. the sound. It sounds um, yes. very loud and it's vibrating in my ears, and I, I actually can't. I can't actually hear <laughs> <laughs> what you're saying properly. Yeah. Um, yes. But, yeah, yes. Yeah. So no, I but, think uh, yes, Helen. Please continue. Yes. Yes. Oh, no, I was just going to invite you to, to actually, if you could um, just repeat, um, please, what yeah. Arisha Shock we can, um, said. We can move just summarize. On to, yeah, we can move on to another question also, because he's from the state of Gujarat in India. And uh, he's worried for that if this deep sea mining uh, starts in a big way, it will be a real jolt to the people of the region. And as what other type of minings have been doing there will be just another uh, another burden yes yes Ajay. yes and um, and i, could, I just yes. would yeah, like yeah. to add to that that you know some of these seabed mining companies they um present themselves as being like cutting edge and um the one in particular that we've got our eye on is uh, this company deep green mm -hmm. um which is very you know smart at trying to market itself and if you look at its website it actually um it sort of markets itself like it's an eco warrior you know they're going to save the planet for um they're going to create a carbon neutral future by you know um supplying these minerals that that we need and um, but really, what what they are is just another startup mining company. They're no different to shock to what you would have experienced mm -hmm. in their approach or their values, you know. So there's there's nothing innovative or um, altruistic about any of these companies. They're they're after the same thing that they're all after, you know. And especially the startup startup mining companies are after a quick buck, mm -hmm. and um, they don't really care what happens next, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a shock would be really great. Uh, maybe we can um, we can email each other and connect with each other. It'd be really good to talk. Yes, yes, we'll we, we, we'll connect both of you together, uh, Helen, so that uh, mm -hmm. you can the conversation and dialogue yeah. continues. Yes, <laughs> we both yeah. yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, Ashokji, you can type in your email ID in the chat box yeah. here. So, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yes, yes. And uh, participants, your last chance to ask questions because we have uh, we have already we are just uh, approaching the closing time. And uh, so, if you have any questions, please ask. Get up and ask and wake up. Uh, we have a question from Nivedita Arjun, and her internet is not working very properly, so she has requested me to ask question on her behalf. And Nivedita says that while deep sea mining is quite a big problem on its own, in India, riverbed mining is also a huge issue. Uh, and uh, should there be uh, enough focus also on preserving the riverbeds within our cities and in, uh, in, within our nation and within our cities? She wants Helen's comments on that. Oh, well, of course, I would say yes, you know, I think, you know, nature is so precious and we need to look after it um, everywhere. I, I don't know, I'm not informed about the nature of India's riverbed mines, but, you know, I have seen, as I referred to in Patni Guinea, the um, total um, sacrificing of really huge river systems because of mine waste. And uh, again, you know, it's local communities who bear the burden of that, not you know, usually not not the companies and um, and governments who make decisions that these things can can be sacrifice zones. So um, everything's connected. Of course, you know the rivers are eventually connected to the sea as well. And um, yes, yes, <laughs> protect them. <laughs> uh, now this one last uh, question plus comment uh, from Rahul uh, Sharma of Hyderabad. Uh, Rahul says. I'm so shocked to listen about deep sea mining. Here in India, we have so far dealt with coal and minerals mining and its impact on local communities and tribals, etc. Maybe we need to learn more on deep sea mining going on here on our coast. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Helen, for raising this very important issue. Uh, and if I heard you correctly, 
you said deep sea mining is globally regulated by usa based agency is that correct or is it under government control also and how do the borders work in oceans uh, i do not know about it myself so can you help us understand that yes well um there there are there are basically two the ocean is viewed in in two two ways i guess there's this um this area that's called it is actually called the area <laughs> it's the area beyond natural um, national jurisdiction and um that so that's like the the common area and um, under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, um, this this area there's a lot of talk in, um, about this area being um, the common heritage of uh, we say humankind, but um, I think the original wording was mankind. Um, and it's that um, that United Nations Convention UNCLOS that has established um, the International Seabed Authority. So it's probably my Australian accent. I, I was saying the ISA before, so not not the US, <laughs> but the but the ISA, the International Seabed Authority. You can you can Google that and see um, what kind of agency they are, but that's the authority that we were very concerned about being, um, you know, under the corporate capture. Of, of seabed mining companies, you know, even before the, the industry has really um, begun in a commercial way. So the, um, the national jurisdiction, the, it's called the EEZ, the Exclusive Economic Zones. And that's, um, oh, you might want to Google that. I, just from memory, I've just, I've just got a mental block on it, but I think it's 200 nautical miles um, from the coastline is um, the extent of the exclusive um, uh, economic zone. And then beyond that is the, the area known as um, the area. And um, I just did a, a little bit, had a little bit of time to have a look at, um, you know, what's going on with, with India. And, um, and so India has um, a very large area apparently of um, within its own exclusive economic zone of uh, the Indian Ocean, but it has also uh, applied for for licenses from the this body, the ISA, for the Central Indian Ocean Basin. So that part of the Indian Ocean is in this um, uh, area beyond national jurisdiction. So um, it looks to me like India is really, you know, starting to get quite serious about developing the capacity to mine for minerals. And um, I assume, um, a shock, you, you, you would probably know more about this, um, about, you know, what the minerals policy of, of India is. But I assume there must be a sense that it needs to be, um, you know, self-sufficient in its own minerals. But today I was also looking at um, information about um, India becoming the um, the world's um, dumping ground. I hadn't realised it was that bad, but the world's dumping ground for electronic waste. And I read that it receives 90% of all the electronic waste generated in the world. And that's some, somehow dumped in India illegally. I don't, I don't understand that, how that happens. Um, but as well as that, India generates domestically 2 million tonnes um, of, uh, of electronic waste every year. So um, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of um, development going on around the um, what's called urban mining, the, the mining of electronic waste dumps. And um, at the moment, I'm sure all of you would know, you know, far more than I do, but um, that, you know, about the, this large area just outside New Delhi, where it's become the largest um, sorting and extraction um, point for electronic waste. And uh, it's totally unregulated and really dangerous, really toxic. Um, 
you know, this could be this could be an industry for India. It would be far less expensive than investing all this capacity in developing these huge machines to go and dev devastate the um, the you know the seabed um, to develop you know safe uh, legal regulated um, electronic waste um, extraction and um, and you know recycling and re, you know providing all these um, minerals that we and metals that we need you know for the carbon free future you know um, so yeah I mean that that could be another you know strong advocacy point within India to challenge you know why why aren't we doing this you know we're investing so much money for an industry that's not actually not going to employ very many Indians in the end right, right. very very rightly said and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Helen just to share with you uh, in fact uh, next week uh, I think it is next week we are hosting a, a session on corporate capture uh, with the oh. uh, uh, animation uh, videos in Hindi and English. So we are holding one session on corporate capture. And all we have talked about is one part of corporate capture, actually. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. So, uh, we have already all overshot the time by almost 10 minutes. So we now come to the end of today's really very, very interesting and informative discussion. And uh, our speaker in today's SDG talks, uh, which was co-hosted by our Indian Institute of Management Indore and CNS, was Dr. Helen Rosenbaum, campaign coordinator for the Deep Sea Mining Campaign. And we will be meeting again tomorrow on Friday, May 22 at 7 p.m. to hear from experts on breast cancer. Our experts for tomorrow are Dr. Pooja Ramakant, Dr. Lopa Mudra Das Roy, and Peggy Miller. So bye till then and stay safe. And our sincere thanks once again to Helen. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you. Thank you.